what percentage in the light will tip us to that shift from 3D to 4D to beyond. Ra gives a exact percentage for both the positive and the negative polarity. Our planet is graduating. We are making that transition to fourth density, but that's because we have the ego already built into human consciousness, which is always driving us to the negative. And so as a catalyst, we have to overcome that negatively polarized function of our mind to separate ourselves, divide everything, label everything, judge everything. We have to transcend that part of ourselves to get to our light side. And so that's the amazing catalyst that the ego fulfills for human consciousness is that it's like the springboard to the fourth density. Cool game if you think about it. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wondered what's the structure of the universe, our evolution, and where we fit in, then do we have the Ra's Law of One, Aaron Abke show for you. Today I'll be talking with Aaron Abke about where we're at in our spiritual evolution, will humanity make it through, and what's been predicted by Venetians, people from Mars, perhaps billions of years ago. So welcome to the show, Aaron, and I almost feel like saying welcome back to the show, my brother. Are you ready to shine? I'm always ready to shine, brother. Thank you for having me. Woohoo! So before we dive right into things, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but are we in a spiritual war? Uh, from, from one perspective, you could definitely say yes. From another perspective, definitely not, because in the absolute, there's nothing to go to war against, right? So that question always depends on from what reference frame we're asking it from, but either one is equally valid in my perspective. Thank you. So if we look at, can you look at things right now as, hmm, it's interesting. So I know where you're going and I know the levels that you're playing at. So this is going to be a very interesting, I like that good conversation. On one level, is there darkness versus light? But if so, you don't defeat the darkness by fighting it, do you? Yeah, you know, it's interesting when we talk about the metaphysics of polarities in the universe, because there's definitely polarity in the universe. In fact, the whole universe is just the interplay of polarity. So again, that's the perspective, the relative perspective from which we can say there's like an interposing conflict going on or, or intermingling going on between light and dark. And um, they don't really fight each other in the sense that they really just cancel each other out meaning that the presence of one is the absence of the other. So really the universe is about just simply choosing which polarity you want, positive or negative, light or dark, and then continuing to refine that choice through the rest of your evolution. And I like that it's the absence because that means that you don't fight the dark. If you bring light, you simply are the light. You go into a dark room with a candle, there is no more darkness. Correct. It might even be true to say that on the positive polarity, there's no sense of fighting or con conflicting with the negative polarity. But on the negative polarity, there definitely is a sense of fighting against the light or being in conflict with the light. And we can get more into to why that is. But uh, the two paths are polar opposites of one another. Uh, you see the yin yang symbol from, mm -hmm. you know, Buddhism, Taoism. Um, there's that little dot in the middle of each white and black semicircle, which represents that at the core, they're still one masculine, feminine, light and dark. They're still one at their core, but the exterior reflection is this seeming opposite of light and dark, but really without one or the other, neither one of them could exist in the universe. And so that's the purpose, right? Is that the polarities give us contrast to experience everything. I like it. And I like to say it's sort of like what I call an electron pump or, you know, an ACDC, not the band, but in this point, your electricity, the alternating current that you have, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, it, it pumps to keep the computer going, but it also helps us with our ascension, our growth, our expansion of having that polarity. Yes. And, and that's what's so interesting about this. Uh, the law of one calls it the third density plane which is where we are right now on earth. And as a species, we're a third density species that is on the precipice of merging, emerging into the fourth density, uh, evolving into the fourth density, which is the density of consciousness where we stop living like we're separate from one another and we stop believing we're separate and we decide to live as one united whole. And that's unity consciousness. Uh, that may seem like a simple thing, but it's probably going to take 
humanity a few thousand years to fully get to that point of true unity consciousness, because we have on this planet an equal balance of light and dark uh, that will always exist on this planet until enough of the collective chooses the light such that we can actually graduate into a positively polarized fourth density planet. So if you haven't heard about the law of one before, that might sound a bit like confusing and esoteric. We can get more into that. But basically what I'm saying is we're on the verge of a massive leap in evolution from separation to unity. And if we take it from an astrological point of view, and today we are going to go different densities. I'm going to go ETs. I'm going to go law of one. Uh, but I had on Dr. Michael Lennox yesterday, and we were talking about astrology of this time period and the astrology of where we're at as human species. And we're entering this age of Aquarius and people go, oh, age of Aquarius, everything's going to change. No, we're talking about thousands of years, <laughs> thousands of years to evolve and get this right. But it doesn't mean the party isn't here right now. Now is a very special time to be here. Now, I want to go back right. in your history a little bit. So I want to understand how you came to your spiritual beliefs. And forgive me for asking this. I've been there too. What was the cult, in quotes, that you escaped in the 20s? Your 20s, not the 20s. <laughs> back in the 1920s. <laughs> I've been aging well, haven't I? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you my secret after the podcast. Um, in my 20s, I really came out of uh, evangelical Christianity, spirit-filled Christianity, you might call it. And uh, that was actually tough to do because I grew up in a really great branch of Christianity. I think a lot of people that grew up Christian it's a lot easier for them to leave their religion because it's so dogmatic and dry and dead and legalistic that the soul is like, barf, get me out of this environment, you know? But my experience wasn't like that, man. I actually loved going to church. Church was my life. I had yeah. an amazing church, amazing church community. I grew up with all these people that were like my family, you know, about a couple hundred people that I knew for the first, you know, 15 18 years of my life, which is a pretty special thing. And then I had amazing parents who were wonderful pastors who never put that typical pastor's kid pressure on me. So yeah. I had a great church upbringing and we didn't really talk about the super dogmatic stuff like hell and the rapture and biblical inerrancy, but I had the universe had in store for me to taste that more legalistic component to my religion that I was just avoiding my whole life. I didn't like those subjects, didn't want to talk about them, never listened to sermons about them. I wanted to talk about the love of God, the love of Jesus and all that good stuff. Yeah. But I went to Oral Roberts University in Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma, got my degree in music and theology and yeah. was planning to be a pastor like my dad. And that was my kind of my life path, I thought. And so I became a full-time worship pastor at 23 and I got a job at a very legalistic church in San Jose where I grew up. Yeah. And within about three months of being there, I couldn't stand it anymore because all that the pastor would preach about would be this kind of deeply separation consciousness messages. We're in, everyone else is out. We're going to heaven. They're going to hell. We need to save them because they're lost. They're going to be tormented forever if they don't repent. And it just, it felt nauseating to me to, to hear that because that wasn't the God I knew in my heart. That wasn't the God I saw in the person of Jesus in the Bible. And I more and more had to face those tough questions of, do I believe this shit or not? Because if the answer is no, then I need to discover what I do believe. Because yeah. it's kind of like a house of cards, right? When you question one thing, everything else unravels with it. And that's why they don't like questioning in the church. So at 23, I blew up my life, quit my job, moved back to Tulsa, and was just kind of starting my life over as a spiritual seeker, finally being open to anything and everything versus my tiny little box of Western Christianity. And so, you know, Alan Watts, Eckhart Tolle, uh, Muji, different teachers like that were my kind of entry level enlightenment teachings, really got into Buddhism and then really got into Hinduism more than anything, Advaita Vedanta. Yeah. And spent about eight years just obsessing over enlightenment teachings from the East and really kind of forgot about my Western upbringing. But after so many years of being in that, what I would consider a very masculine approach to spirituality, you know, the knowledge, the concepts, the understanding, that was what I was lacking big time in church, which had totally twisted theology. 
but I had kind of lost my core of that heart centered devotion to God, that worship of God, that love of God that I got a lot, a huge dose of in Western Christianity. So at that point, I kind of went back to my roots a bit and got more into the Christian mysticism and re-envisioning Christ's message from an enlightenment perspective. And yeah, it was really yeah. the merger of East and West that gave me what I felt like was a complete sense of spirituality that is really the foundation of what I teach from today. I love it. And and I have a very interesting spiritual background that had Judaism, it had Catholicism, it had at one point uh, in evangelical Christian church. Ah. Uh, I was actually going to evangelical Christian church for one service on the weekend and then going to temple. I think it might've been the reverse order for uh, Sabbath services on the other evening of the weekend. Interesting. And, and I was in the church choir too. And in the church choir, something interesting happened is uh, the pastor uh, went around and uh, did interviews. I guess he would do this every once in a while. He would interview oh, wow. everybody in, the, in, in the, um, the choir to see where people are at. And I told him, uh, I asked him one very specific, interesting question. I didn't plan on sharing this, but I, I, I said, um, if God has a plan for me, is it possible that I could mess it up? And his answer to that was, I'm sorry, Michael. I don't think you're ready to be in the choir anymore. And he kicked really? me out of the choir for that question. Publicly. Yeah. So <laughs> he... It, it it was wow. You could not question, but what I'm seeing right now, and and I think at its basis, and particularly at at, at its zenith, at its at its peak, but when we look at the mystical side of Christianity, when we look at the mystical side of Judaism and mystical side of any religion, it's beautiful, it's oneness, it's unity, consciousness. But I think the newer gen is stepping back from the religious dogma at this point. And saying there's something more than this human construct, which says you can't question. Mm -hmm. So it's a fascinating your journey you've been on because I think more than most, you've had to shatter paradigms. Mm -hmm. And I think once you break that glass, once you break that mirror into a thousand pieces, you can't put it back together again and you're able to see something new. So I, I want to dive into that. And, and I want to start with, we're going to go way down the woo-woo rabbit hole. And then we're going to, we're going to bring it back to all of the different densities epic this this planet right now is we'll call it epic we'll call it uh, a matrix we'll call it authoritarian we'll call it a power struggle we'll call it interesting we'll call it here for our better uh um here for our um greatest evolution in many ways mm -hmm. uh, do you think there's a power structure in this planet though that's in touch with i'm going to put this in quotes negative ets other civilization other beings that are trying to have an influence on <clears throat> how we evolve so let's break this down so we can get a really good answer to this question, because I could say yeah. yes or no, and it wouldn't mean a lot, right? So the most important framework the Law of One gave me, I think, was the understanding of polarity, the two so polarities. So let me back you up then. Let me back you up and let's describe, sorry if I jumped ahead. What is the Law of One? Where did the Law of One come from? Sure. And how did you come to the Law of One? Yeah. Yeah. Law of One is a channel text from the 1980s from a group of extraterrestrial researchers from the 80s who were really investigating this UFO phenomenon back in the 70s and 80s, which was really blasting off back then. Lots and lots of UFO sightings. And they were like, hey, clearly there's beings here. Uh, why are they here? What's their purpose? What's their intention? And this group being uh, more spiritually minded had the brilliant recognition that if we really want to understand who these beings are and why they're here, we should be a lot more interested in their philosophy and in their spirituality than yes. just their technology. Like, how did they get here in these crafts? Not the most important question right now. Not the most interesting question. Why did they come here and why are they staying here without contacting us openly? And so that's why that's how they began the law of one sessions. Um, I'll skip some of the story. Basically, it ended up being three people from that group. Don Elkins, who was the questioner, Carla Rukart, who was the uh, channeler, and then Jim McCarty, who was the scribe, transcribing all the channeling sessions. And over a four year period, they did about 106 channeled sessions with an entity that had come through, which identified itself as Ra. And 
through the Q&A, Ra answers all the questions they ask about the nature of the universe, the structure of the universe, the how and the why of the universe in a way that just gives you these answers to those kinds of questions we all ask and wonder inside that are unbelievably satisfying and like makes your inner child leap for joy when you hear them because you're like, I knew it had to be that amazing, you know? And it all makes sense. It answers every question about the reality we see about us, in my perspective, at least. Yeah. And one of those really interesting questions that it answers is called the Fermi paradox. So scientists have have given this name to the question of if there is clearly, there has to be lots and lots of life in the universe. You know, we can look at the stars in our observable galaxy and all that, and we can actually see how many planets are orbiting them, what kinds of planets they are. We can tell those things. And we know that there's a very large percentage, something like 10% of all planets are in that habitable zone of their star where water is there and life should be forming. And, you know, when you have trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of stars with to the power of, to the power of planets around those stars, you have to go just logically. Okay. We have to accept the fact that the universe is brimming with life. We're like a, it's like a pond with all kinds of bacteria everywhere swimming in it. So then why don't we see other beings coming here? Yes. That's the Fermi paradox. If the universe is full of life, and if it's full of the amount of life we think it is, there should be ETs buzzing around our skies everywhere like the Jetsons. So why not? Why don't we see that? And ironically, we actually kind of do see that, right? We see UFOs every day in our skies. It's kind of become normal now. People are like walking down Manhattan. They're like, hey, a UFO. Ooh, ah, and they just go about their day. I was part of a mass sighting, this will date me, back in 80 or 81 that made Tom Bronk, Tom Brokaw, Dan Rather, the uh, the, the evening news nationwide in New York City. Mm. There were these things spinning up above uh, above the Statue of Liberty and doing all sorts of, you know, tic-tac-toe kind of stuff up there. Wow. My really good friend actually just had a, what I think is like the most remarkable UFO slash ET encounter I have ever heard of yeah. um, just a few days ago, but I won't get into that right now. So the, the law of one. Oh, whoa, 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 hold on. Hold on. You, what are you at liberty let me to off with that, huh? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's talk about aliens. He was in Dallas with another good friend of ours and uh, yeah. they were in the their friend's hot tub, our friend's hot tub at night. And they saw all of a sudden like 20 to 30 lights, orbs yeah. in the sky And, uh, they were kind of moving around in these cool patterns and they were like, Oh my gosh, are these UFOs? And he said that one of the lights began to descend down towards them. And he said, it wasn't a craft. It was an orb of light, which, uh, the law of one also explains the way that extraterrestrials evolve through the densities and at the fifth density and above the, the body that a being is inhabiting is pure electromagnetic energy. So as we evolve, we we get imbued with more and more light in the physical body. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so like you, we've all seen the movie Avatar, right? Yeah. You know how their bodies are much more glowy and translucent with light, much more dense with light, very blue, radiant bodies. That's, that is what a fourth density being would really look like is a very radiant, glowing body. And then in the fifth density, after, you know, millions of more years of evolution, beings because the, the the domain of consciousness is so incredibly high frequency mm-hmm. the physical vehicle that it's hosting needs to be equally high frequency to match the level of consciousness right that's why you don't see you know animals like a, a gopher or something with extraordinary intelligence because a, go- a gopher doesn't have the kind of body that could even put to use that level of intelligence you know the body always matches the level of intelligence in the universe for that reason. So they're just really beings of pure light that um, they can decide to create a illusion of a body. And this happens very often in ET encounters. They can appear like a human being to make someone less afraid of them. They can appear like one of their past incarnations. If they need to, they can make the light do whatever it wants to do. But when they're just chilling, they're just going to be an orb of light, meaning they concentrate all their energy into one singular point, kind of like a star would look. 
So this orb of light, they said, and he, he left me the voice message with our buddy, John, who was also there. And they were both describing it to me, which makes it more interesting. Cause if it's only one person, your mind has the skepticism of like, maybe he made it up. But like when two people saw the same thing, you're like, wow, you know, I don't think both my friends are pathological liars. <laughs> And so this orb of light descends down to them and they said that it got within five feet of them. Oh, wow. And they said it was no bigger than like a tennis ball in terms of like the concentration of light that they saw. And then it had a, a radiating belt of light coming out of it. But he said he could actually see what looked like eyes in the center of it. And they said it was, they were just like kind of sitting there in stunned silence as this ball of light is right in front of them. And they said, as soon as we felt fear initially, the, the being backed away from us to sort of like honor our free will right away. And then they started talking to each other and they were like, send it love, send it love. Yes, yes, yes. And so they started sending it love and then it approached really close. And they said for about 30 seconds, it just emanated this like incredible warm glow of love around them. And they were just like, oh, like all blissed out. <laughs> and then they said it just slowly retreated back into the sky. And I was like, dude, if, if that really happened, which I don't doubt it did, that's probably the most profound encounter I've ever heard of. It makes me wonder, having having had uh, two NDEs and God knows what other experiences, and I'm sure you've had some interesting experiences yourself. You've had two NDEs? It, yeah, it was it was a thing. But yes, yes, wow, yes, man. I have. You got a lot of catch up on, bro. <laughs> no, we, <laughs> we, we, we do then. We get to go more to your spiritual awakening. So we're going to get to density here. We're going to go back it, it, just, just for one more moment on this, this ET situation. If anybody has ever had an experience with, like years ago, I had uh, a, a uh, endangered timber rattlesnake climb up on a tree and turn around and face my wife, Jessica, and myself. And we just locked eyes for like 20 or 30 minutes. This is a giant rattlesnake. Wow. And we just spent that time in sacred nothingness with the snake. But now we can go back to that spot and go back to that time and learn from it. And it's like a key to unlock something. And that's to me what, what all awakening experiences are. Well, all NDEs are a key to unlock something to the other side. That's also what uh, an eclipse, if you actually get to spend time in a totality, it is a portal to the other side that you can come back to anytime. There's a frequency. Mm -hmm. So what your friends, in my opinion, have been gifted is if they go in meditation now and they go back to this experience, that is the portal now. That orb is the portal beyond yeah. which the education, the learning begins. And we all have these experiences. We poo-poo them in this society. We, we mm -hmm. push them all away. That couldn't be real. No, that didn't really happen. I didn't really experience that. Or you're told it's not real. But if you realize, wait a second, nothing happens by accident. This is all a cosmic setup to help us. Then you can spend time going back to it. And for your friends, there's some amazing, I have no other way to put it. There's some amazing shit that can come out of this. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to encourage them both to do that for sure. Because I fully agree with you on that. Um, can I wrap up the Fermi paradox thing real quick? <laughs> Please do bring us back. <laughs> Y'all want to know about the Fermi paradox? So in the law of one, they explain that positively polarized beings who've now graduated from third density, which again is this density you and I are in right now. Yeah. They call the third density, the choosing, because the entire reason the soul comes here on the sort of like path of evolution through those seven planes or densities is that the third density is now the, the the choice between darkness and light, meaning just like in quantum mechanics, every particle has to have a charge to do work in the quantum realm. Work means the ability to produce change in your environment, right? So if you don't have a charge, you can't cause any change in your environment. You're neutral, you're, you're inert. And so every particle, electrons being negative, protons being positive, they have a charge so they can do work in the quantum yes. realm. Well, Ra says, you're like that. You are like a particle that needs a charge. And so the soul is here in third density to experience that perfect yin yang we talked about of darkness and light, of which are equally available in third density. You know, if you want to experience immense spiritual beauty here, you absolutely can. Or you can experience immense darkness and separation. Both are available here, right? And eventually, after so many human lifetimes of playing in the dark and the light, the soul will make a natural choice, or maybe the soul will gravitate naturally towards one or the other. 
And I think they say that it's somewhere around 90% of souls in the universe end up choosing the positive and about 10% or so choose the negative. So the universe is overwhelmingly positive, but that's also a kind of design because the purpose of the negative polarity is to take power over others. So if it was flipped and it was 90% negative beings in the universe, the positive would stand no chance to exist at all. The negative would completely wipe it out because they would take over every planet they could get their hands on. So there needs to be a massive balance towards the light to keep yeah. the darkness in check because the darkness, the negative polarity doesn't have the same virtues that the positive has. And so this is where we get into the Fermi paradox. On the positive polarity, once you've graduated from third density to fourth, you are on what they call the path of service to others. Yes. Meaning your, your entire existence is about being of service to the universe, seeing all beings as one with yourself. And so one of the biggest laws on the positive polarity is to never yeah. infringe upon free will. Because the, infringing on free will is what the negative polarity does, right? The negative polarity gains charge by infringing on people's free will. Whereas the positive gains charge by honoring the free will of others. So let's look at the positive first. The reason that positive ETs don't land on the front lawn of the White House and invite us into their UFOs to have a conversation with them yeah, is because it yeah. would freak the planet out. There's tons of people on this planet, especially all the religious people, that it would completely disorient their paradigm of reality. Yeah. And from a loving being like a fourth density ET, they would never do such a thing. It'd be like us running into a, a little herd of zebras, you know, screaming at them with weapons in our hands and stuff. Like it would freak them out. They'd run away in fear. That's what it would be like if ETs landed openly. It would scare everybody, right? So they need to be at a very great distance from us. And mm -hmm. yet they really, really want to be of service to us because our planet's not doing so hot right now. So what they're doing is they're making their presence known in the skies to, I call it the acclimation phase where they're acclimating us to their presence in a way that if you think about it, it's very intelligent to what they're doing. If you wanted to prove to a, even an animal or animal species that you're observing, if yeah. you want to show them that you're there without making them afraid of you, what would you have to do? You'd have to just hang out at a far enough distance away in the open so they can observe you and get to know that, hey, if this being here had bad intentions, surely they would have acted on them by now. Right. And so slowly but surely you acclimate those animals to your presence and they stop fearing you. And this is what research scientists literally do, right? With like monkeys and different animals they're trying to shoot documentaries of. They have to spend a lot of time around them to calm them down and say, hey, we're not a threat. Right. There was a there was a Christmas decades ago. Uh NCAR, National Center of Atmospheric Research, Boulder, Colorado. Big snowy day. I hiked up to this thing. All the roads are closed. And there was a deer sitting down with a uh, uh black and white. I think it's a mockingbird sitting on top of it. And, and wow. birds, I guess, sit on deer on occasion. And I saw this and I'm like, well, that's just too cool. And I sat down and I just spent hours sitting near the deer and mockingbird. I took a whole bunch of pictures. Wow. But I didn't move. I just spent time in that field. And I probably could have gone closer and closer. It's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. There's a comfort zone that grows. Exactly. And isn't that really intelligent on their behalf to say, hey, if we want to help these poor, this poor species without freaking them out, we might just need to show ourselves for quite a while so that they understand, look, guys, we have technology well beyond what you have, and yet we're not harming you. So we must not have bad intentions. And so it's really, they're waiting on our free will to collectively reach out to them and say, we see you, we acknowledge you, and we want relationship with you. And then they would actually probably come down and walk amongst us openly and share technology and whatnot. But before we give them that invitation, they probably won't do that, right? And so the best we're going to get is channeled connections with them, mm -hmm. people communicating with them telepathically. And then maybe we can have some dialogue about like, hey, how do you guys want to help us out down here? Because we're struggling, you know? So that's why positive ETs don't um, land openly on our planet and reveal themselves. But what about negative ETs? Well, the law of one says, because of that, that function that I mentioned of the negative polarity, wanting to enslave the entire universe, 
Yep. They'll never, ever be satisfied with the level of power they have. It's always about the next conquest and the next conquest. They they actually do something called the quarantine around developing third density planets. Because again, that balance of positive and negative energies on the planet has to be equal, 50%. And any outside infringement adding more negativity would tilt that balance more towards the negative which in their estimation is no longer a truly fair choice. And so they're trying to protect third density planets like ours from too much infringement by the negative polarity. But to get back to your question, that doesn't yes. mean that negative ETs, even though they can't come here physically, because if they could, they would, it doesn't mean they can't come here telepathically. And they certainly do that. And they're allowed to do that by the positive polarity, because positive beings don't want to totally infringe on negative beings either and take away all ability for them to be negative. They leave it very open. They're trying to keep balance in the universe. So I, I want to go to the different rays or densities, and I want to understand this. But I guess one of the most interesting things to me is because I, I believe this is all a cosmic setup. Uh, the darkness serves the light, the light serves the, it, it. It's all oneness at the end of the day. And, and, and there's a lot of semantics behind it. Um, however... It, it sounds to me that even choosing an evolution in darkness and saying, I want to spend X a number of lifetimes in the dark could actually help in the greater scheme of your evolution serve you. You can only get to a certain level, perhaps. And I want to talk about the different, the different rays now, but I can't see how that experience, as crazy as it is, may not benefit you. Now, of course, there's the easy way or the hard way, maybe one the easier way but maybe not everyone. Yeah. Well, you're definitely right. And I would say it benefits the whole universe more so than anything mm -hmm. in that we need to have that negative polarity. In fact, there's a really interesting passage in the law of one where they're asking Ra about ancient, ancient, ancient worlds, maybe even in universes prior to this one, before there was polarity, when yes. there was just the positive and there was no negative. And Ra says that, development in third density was basically eternal. Uh, the beings couldn't graduate to fourth density. It took them very, very long to graduate because without any kind of consequence for not evolving, there was just no motivation to evolve. And so Ra gives this example of children in school who are not punished if they don't do their homework. And they're also not rewarded for doing their homework. So what are those kids going to do? They're just going to play in the sandbox, have fun, right? So he said third density beings were like children in school like that who had no motivation to do work. And so they just, everything's perfect. Everything's one, la, 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 la. And they weren't getting into the deeper levels of the metaphysics of reality that are available. And so at one point, a certain logos and logos here being a certain star, a, a solar system star, uh, these are these are solar consciousnesses. So they are sentient beings, stars are. And they actually create the archetypal laws of their solar system. So every star has a slightly different zodiac than every other star. And the farther away you travel from your star, the more and more bizarre those zodiac archetypes would be to you. So like, I think Sirius is the closest star. Is that right? Go ahead. So like, let's say you and I could travel to Sirius and study the Zodiac symbols on Sirius, maybe instead of the 12 or really 13 uh, Zodiacs <laughs> that we have, maybe they would have like 10 and they would be, they would have Aries, Taurus, Gemini, and maybe it leaves off at 10 or something It'd like that. still but be, be recognizable close. because yes. we're not that far from what we can see in the sky. But as we travel star to star to star, we're getting really far out there in the galaxy we'd encounter archetypes we've never imagined before and be like, what do we call this archetype? You know, So one star decided to run a new experiment in its solar system. And that experiment, because every, every star is an experiment, by the way, they say like the creator literally doesn't know the outcome of every experiment, yeah. every galaxy, every star, every planet, every being is an experiment. Your very life right now is an experiment the creator is running with certain rules in place. And so one of these stars said, what if we veiled the memory of beings who are incarnating into third density so that they don't remember who they are or where they came from? They don't remember their past lives and they don't know where they're going. They're just 
in a dream world with no context, what would that do, I wonder? And so the experiment was run, and the product of that experiment was the negative polarity, which, as we know, is the path of separation or ignorance or forgetfulness of truth. And so once the negative polarity was born, stakes got turned up real quick in third density because now there's grave consequences to not doing your spiritual homework. You know what I mean? And so these beings were actually evolving through third density very fast. But another interesting outcome happened that some beings were actually graduating, but not to the positive. They were graduating to the negative, yeah. to fourth density negative. And so now new planetary systems are, are born in the universe, meaning planets can now actually become negatively polarized instead of positively polarized. And that had never happened before. And you would think from our like limited religious framework of mind on planet earth that the stars would be going, Oh no, this is terrible. We created darkness. But Ra says the, the, the logos in the universe were very celebrating of this saying, what a fantastic experiment this was. Let's keep running this thing. And so, you know, billions and billions of years later, here we are. A couple of key questions. Does this mean then this experiment is a simulation? You could definitely look at it like that because that what's in a simulation other than an experiment, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and then the, the second thing is, I'm wondering about the critical mass involved. And I think that's an important concept at this time here on earth, because we can look at the news, what I call the negative worthless stimulation, which is freaking people out today by design. Yep. We can look at that and feel we're, we're going to, to heck in a handbasket, or we can recognize that our neighbors seem to be even kinder. There's even more goodness going on. And that if we choose it, this can actually be the ripple effect that, uh, that starts the dominoes that take over the earth. Uh, take over? Is that the right term for it? But you get where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That reach that tipping point into the light. So can you talk with me about tipping points? I would even say that, that those dominoes are already falling and mm -hmm. we're rushing towards that tipping point. Yeah. But you know, I've, I have my predictions of when that tipping point will be. They actually ask Ra in the Law of One, when will Earth officially become a fourth density positive planet? Because right now we're in the in the process of being magnetized to a higher density. Um, and so the, the energies coming up on the planet are very intense and very fast, the way things are manifesting. Because Earth yeah. is like mm, getting magnetized. Faster and faster. A, yeah, yeah. So all the third density stuff has to come up and be seen to be healed and transmuted off the planet. And so we're, we're in that dark night of the soul collectively, but in terms of the tipping point, they say, when will that happen? And Ra says our estimations. And by the way, Ra is a sixth density social memory complex. So they are able to look into the future and into the past in thought uh, like from that, where from Venus. And so they say, based on our projections uh, of the future, it will happen anywhere between 100 to 700 years from now. And that was back in the 80s. So that's the time frame we're probably looking at for Earth to wake up to our oneness, stop murdering each other, stop killing each other, stop dividing, and truly unite in, in a kind of a heart-based way. Uh, we're not that far away from it, right? That's not in our lifetime, but it's relatively close. Why will that take place? And you mentioned earlier that humanity is in trouble right now. Is trouble part of that design, part of that play back and forth that is actually helping us to get to that tipping point? Yeah. In the same way that, you know, somebody who's been extremely traumatized in their life, mm -hmm. they may need to act out their trauma for a while before they're at a place where they're ready to begin healing it. Yeah. Everything has... Everything is imbued with karmic energy and you can't rush karma. It has to play out, right? And the only thing you can do to accelerate karma is to let it play out. And lean into the like, shadow. Yeah, yeah. Because humanity has had how many wars in our history? How many billions and billions of people have been murdered in cold blood on our planet, raped, tortured? Like there's been a lot of negative karma on this planet. Ch tr child trafficking, we know now. And so the only way out is through and humanity is going through our shadows right now. And that's yeah. part of the healing process is we have to see these things. And this is why as a side tangent, why I get um, 
a little bit perturbed with spiritual people who say, stop paying attention to the world, ignore it. You're supposed to just keep to yourself and meditate. Don't get involved. Don't get involved. And there's some truth to that. We don't want to get sucked into the negative frequency, of course, but oh my goodness, why else would your soul have wanted to come to this planet if not to be of service to it? I'm not sure about your show, and I'm going to be tuning into your show more now, Aaron. This is awesome. But the whole reason I do every single thing I do is not so that we can hunker down into a cave right now. In fact, that drives me completely insane. Mm -hmm. We get centered, we get grounded, we do the inner work, we lean into the shadow, we lean into the wounds, and then we step forward in whatever way we're called. Mm -hmm. We don't say, I'm a spiritual being having a spiritual existence. I don't need to worry about stop signs and traffic lights. No, you don't mow anybody down. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you look what you can do to help others to not get mowed down as well. Well said. I mean, that is part of the evolution of consciousness is like, yeah, it's fun to, to talk about oneness and to study oneness, but what's really fun is to live oneness, to create oneness on the planet. That's way more cutting edge than just reading books about it and chatting online about it. And a lot of people want to stay in that mode of just talking about it, but not living it and bringing it to the planet. What's so interesting to me about that specifically is we chose, no matter what story one you put behind it, we are here in a 3D, third dimension, density world, a heavy world, so that we can play with physicality. It's not an accident we're here. If we didn't want to play with physicality, we can flit around back on the other side of the veil and go yeehaw all day, but there are no consequences, which you're talking about, mm -hmm. but there's yep. also no clay to mold. We're here to mold. Why would we choose otherwise? So this, this concept of enlightenment, and you have a beautiful definition that I'd like to get from you in a moment, but this concept of enlightenment that I'm going to become an enlightened being and therefore I don't have to participate in it. You wanted to participate in it. This is the good stuff. Exactly, man. And I think even people with NDEs report on this all the time that when you cross over to that side, the, let's say the non-physical, and you look back at your life, you realize that a human incarnation is this amazing soul adventure to give the creator glory in physical form. Yes, because yes. on that side, the creator already has all glory and all beings are already in full knowledge of the creator. And that's beautiful beyond words. But at the same time, the soul begins building a kind of aching hunger to say, God, please send me into the darkness somewhere so I can bring your light and your love to the world, to those who are lost. And the soul wants to worship the creator by bringing the creator's light into manifestation. And so it says, I will incarnate into a human lifetime. And then you get here and say, I am just here to read books and keep to myself. And, <laughs> well, go ahead, you first. Well, I was going to say, did Jesus do that? Did Buddha do that? Did Gandhi do that? These are the most legendary humans who ever lived because they died into their character, into their mission, into their purpose. They didn't choose to just avoid it and say, well, I transcended the world. Now I'm going to go and sit in a cave by myself. It's interesting. It's 2023. This will be coming out at the end of 2023, going into 2024. And we may, may theoretically have been able to hide into a cave until 2020. And then this funny mm -hmm. thing happened <laughs> as the yeah. old world collapsed, as we were forced into a cave, <laughs> the COVID yeah. cave mask, to blow us the heck out of it. It's not possible to go back into the safety zone. It's not possible to hide under the covers or what I call to ostrich up anymore. And the more that you attempt to ostrich up, the more the world is going to chase you down and faster than ever to help with this acceleration, to help with this um, ascension, to help with this giant shift. Yeah. It's kind of like just stop being such a spiritual beta or something. Step into your power, live your purpose, bring your fire. You came here for a reason. Discover that reason and live it. That's the most fulfilling way to live life is to be a conduit of, of the divine here on earth, not to be an escapist or something or an escape artist. There's no, there's no love in that. There's no beauty in that. And so there's a line from A Course in Miracles that I often quote when I talk about this topic, which says, the end of the world is not its destruction, but its translation into heaven. And that's important because when we are truly in living in the awareness of oneness, in the awareness of the creator, then we see this world, yes, this one right now in the exact predicament it's in, we see it as heaven. 
We see it as perfect. We see no evil to be vanquished. We see nothing separate from us to be overcome or, or transcended. We realize everything is me at different vibrations. And so, yes, to those who are choosing the negative path and trying to bring control and domination over, over the earth, we may still want to be of service to the world by raising awareness of that and bringing healing, but we never do it from a disposition of, I'm fighting against the darkness on this planet. We realize the darkness is just a catalyst. It's just here to give us contrast so we can learn and we evolve. And actually, Ra says that in the Law of One, when they define the negative polarity, here's their yeah. definition. They say, the negative polarity is that which provides catalyst to the positive polarity. Catalyst to the positive. I like it. And it, it, it this kind of brings things full circle early. We're not done yet, but it brings things full circle here, which is uh, <laughs> not only that which you fight against, that which you resist persists, mm -hmm. uh, but it, you can never fight against or win against anything. We can see this on earth. Every single yeah. war has led, it could be a decade, it could be a century later, every single war has led to another war because you never, there's never been as, as I think it was George Bush senior, maybe very long time ago, there's never been a war for peace. It, the concept doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. And so fighting darkness to bring it into the light ain't going to get anybody anywhere. And so it takes this shifting of, wow, that's really freaky tiki what's going on over there. But I will sort of like that orb that came to visit your friends. I will not go to a place of fear. Mm -hmm. I will go to a place of love. And that's not a meaningless thing. That's not a warm, foo-foo, fuzzy, woo-woo thing. That's actually action. That can be powerful action of stepping yeah. forward in love. I think everything begins at the level of perception. And on that level, there's only two choices we can make. We can choose to see oneness or we can choose to see separation. And so that's why what you fight, you strengthen, and you can't defeat negative energy by fighting it. Because let me ask you this, what perception are you holding towards something that you feel the need to fight? Are you holding them in a oneness perception or a separation perception? Yeah, it's very clear. It's a separation. It's a fear. Okay. If we want to be honest at the end of the day, it's a, a gifted addiction even. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's, it's one of the ego's primary or favorite energies is the fighting energy because yes. it's a deeply separative energy to hold. So yeah, you can't overthrow the Illuminati, the, the cabal, the deep state by hating them and fearing them and wanting to fight against them. They grow more powerful as you do that because they're vibrating on a negative frequency already and you're sending them more negative frequency. So they're just like, thanks, I'll take that charge. Fear me, fight me. They love it, right? It's how they grow and, and gain charge. Whereas if you say- I, I, call that, I call that Darth Vader syndrome. Perfect analogy. But if you say to the negatively polarized being or beings, I love you, my brothers and my sisters. You're one with me. I send you my love and blessings. You do what's called depolarization. And Ra says, this is the only thing you ever need to do to ward off a negative being, whether they're in the physical or the non-physical, is when you're in the presence of a negative being, send them love and send them light in your heart, see them as one with you, and they will retreat faster than you can blink. Because on the negative polarity, Ra explains this as well, it's, it's very difficult to gain negative charge. Because what you have to do to gain negative charge is you have to control others. You have to enslave them, take power over them. And that's not so easy to do with a, a universe full of free beings. Beings don't want to be controlled, right? So you either have to do it against their will, against their awareness, or in an agreed relationship where I get to be your master, you get to be my servant, kind of like Star Wars. You know, you have like Darth Maul and Darth Sidious. It's yes. perfect. Star Wars paints it perfectly, dude. On the negative, there's always the master-disciple relationship because both beings will polarize more negatively like that. But at some point, the disciple will try to overthrow their master and take that position. And if you remember, one of the Star Wars episodes, I want to say Qui-Gon Jinn tells okay. Obi-Wan this, that Darth Maul killed his predecessor to take his spot. I could be wrong, but that's what I remember from the movie. So what's most interesting to me about this then 
is, and I want to get to that critical mass again, you cannot have, it's so hard to have critical mass to the negative because yes. you're not getting all of the negative to work together. As soon as you have work together, it suddenly actually pops back to the light and back to the positive. So you have to have this continual, uh, 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 what do we call it? It's like a, pyramid. a Ponzi scheme. Yes, a yeah. pyramid, exactly. You have to have this Ponzi scheme, this pyramid of power, and one's gonna be going after the next, and one's gonna be going after the next. And if suddenly all of a sudden people wanted to work together, you no longer have that power structure and it collapses. Yeah. And we see that in our actual 3D world, right? With like the different controlling powers on, on the planet different factions of wealthy billionaires, banking elites, political elites who are trying to work together to take power over the people. Even amongst them, they only work together to the extent that they have a shared goal, right? They know that one person by themselves could never take over the whole world, but there's a couple thousand people who all want to do it. So they're like, let's team up and do it together. And then we'll fight for power once we've taken over the world. We'll see which one of us gets the, the king's throne, right? So they'll work together only because they have a shared goal. But Ra says, on the negative polarity, there is always the pecking order and the hierarchy in that there's one being ultimately at the top, which rules over all the other beings. Yeah. And I have a personal theory that uh, the name of that being who is infringing on our planet with negative telepathy, maybe like you alluded to earlier, like giving information to those beings to how to control our planet. I think it's the entity they call Baphomet. Okay. Because, you know, Freemasonry, all these dark, occult, black magic groups, they all seem to worship this entity called Baphomet or, or Lucifer, whatever you want to call yeah. it. But Baphomet, I believe, might actually be the name of that being who's at the top of that pyramid. And underneath them are all the minions who serve them. And the lower you go, the lesser of a class you're in, but everyone's always fighting to go up the ladder, right? And eventually, at the second point of the ladder, beings may even team up to overthrow the leader because he's become so negatively charged that no one person can overthrow him by themselves. So these negative beings will team up to overthrow even a leader, and then they duke it out to see who wins. So it's this constant king of the hill battle on the negative path. How do we choose not to play that game? Because it's being it's being indoctrinated, it's being trained, it's being entrained, it's being gifted to us. And if you read the news, that is part of this big bad world, have to fight to get this, have to fight against another scarcity. You're not good enough. There's yeah. there's a, a calling card. How do we say, I'm not going to play that game anymore? Well, you have to do what Jesus recommended you do, which is to die to yourself take up your cross and follow the Christ, the Christ being that eternal spark within yourself. Yeah. You have to die to the egoic identity, which is the only reason you would want the service to self path. And that's what I meant when I said our planet already has equal balance of dark and light. We don't need any more darkness on the planet. In fact, for most of our Thank history, <laughs> we've, we've chosen more of the darkness and yeah. it's probably at points been 80% negative and 20% positive. But again, that's also given us contrast to want to go back to the light again. And so we're really returning back to the light right now through this great awakening of realizing, hey, guys, we've been um, very irresponsible with the way we've allowed this planet to evolve. We've allowed these superstructures of institutional power and governmental power to completely take over the planet. And now we got to clean up that mess because they coming for us. And if we don't assert our own freedom and human rights and stand on those truths, they will take them from us. And isn't that a great catalyst to step into empowerment and unity? What would you say is, it's interesting because you said we've had other periods of darkness and I'm thinking about, well, there was this time period they called the dark ages, for mm -hmm. instance. And what's interesting about things like the dark ages is, at least when you read the history books, it ground on and on and on so incredibly slowly where it yeah. seems we're in this hyper accelerated uh, vacuum chamber right now. In fact, I want to go through the different rays. I want to continue along the rays in a minute, but what percentage would you say it is? Because mm -hmm. it's not obviously 50%. What percentage in the light will tip us to that shift from 3D to 4D to beyond? So this is great because Ra gives a exact percentage for both the positive and the negative polarity. And this is how we know that we're currently below 51%. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe technically speaking, but 
Ross says to graduate to the positive polarity, fourth yeah. density positive, a planet yeah. must become 51% or more positively polarized or service to others oriented. And Ross says that our planet is graduating. We are making that transition to fourth density, but we just barely made it is what they're basically alluding to. And so maybe right now we're at like 49%, 50%. And yeah. it might take another 100, 200 years to get that 51%. But at 51%, and I mean, maybe we're at 30%, I don't know. But at 51%, the planet's momentum towards the positive is too great to be overcome by the negative. And it continues to accelerate because the positive polarity is the path of harmony, wholeness, unity. And so it functions beautifully well and perfectly and, and very powerfully as well. Whereas the negative path is the path of separation. And so they say for a planet to reach fourth density, negative graduation mm -hmm. requires 95% or more negative polarization. So it's a much higher threshold on the negative versus the positive, but that's because we have the ego already built into human consciousness, which is always driving us to the negative. And so as a catalyst, we have to overcome that negatively polarized function of our mind to separate ourselves, divide everything, label everything, judge everything. We have to transcend that part of ourselves to get to our light side. And so that's the amazing catalyst that the ego fulfills for human consciousness is that it's like the springboard to the fourth density. Cool game if you think about it. If you can step I'm back, get you, to man. your higher self, this is where the party's at. We chose to be here to play this game right now. We're playing a high level, super cutting edge game, man. We should all be happy. Ooh, so, all right, take us through the densities. Third density going to fourth density. Ooh, hold on one second. Hold on, hold <laughs> on, hold on. Somebody heard this is where the party is at. <laughs> oh my goodness. You just appeared out of nowhere. And just wanted to join the party. This is your oh new friend, Erin. Goodness. Look at her. <laughs> Dude, the innocence and radiance of children is just so special. Where's Hannah? There she is. Where's Hannah? Where's Hannah? There you are. You know, we're going through some good teething right now, aren't we? Yeah. She's got some good teeth on her, man. She does. The new gen does not have the indoctrination, I believe, to the darkness that's been gifted to us. Yes, I agree with that. Or they won't, at least. <laughs> <laughs> not if we can do anything about not it. Not if we have anything to say about it. But they, I don't believe, I know, you don't believe. They also, if we want to talk about 51% and 95%, they see through. They have so much. Okay. Mwah. Bye, bye. You want to say bye? Bye, bye. <laughs> uh, so cute. It takes so much more. Thank you, Hannah Bear. It takes so much more to convince them of the darkness. And I believe that's what's actually part of big part of what's going on right now is this last gasp of the darkness here on the planet because yes. we can see through it. And particularly mm -hmm. the new gen. It's not going to take it anymore. It's going, are you mm -hmm. kidding me? The, uh, I think 2020 not only woke us up, we, the people, but it woke up the controllers as well, because I think that they didn't realize how awake the world was. I think when they rolled out the, you know what, pokey, pokey, Fauci, ouchie, <laughs> I think that they, uh, I think they thought it would be like 80 to 90% of people would take it. And, um, the polls are always skewed. They'll say like 30% of people are unvaccinated. But I think it's more like 40%, if I'm being honest. In my experience, maybe I'm in a bubble or something, but it feels like I meet more people who didn't take it than those who did. So I'm like, it's got to be higher than 25, 30%, but it's it's higher than they thought, right? And I think that that woke them up in the sense of, oh boy, this planet's awakening fast with technology, the internet, social media, information travels. We can't keep this lockdown control we've always had much longer unless we do something drastic meaning we've got about 10 years to turn this world into a military police state. And that was 2020. And so what's their big thing? Agenda 2030. They're trying to shift the world into a certain direction by 2030. And it's it gives me this kind of laughable picture of like one guy trying to herd 5 million pigs into a pen. 
<laughs> he's like, come on, come on, guys. And there's just like an endless sea of, of pigs in all directions. Most of them can't even hear him. It's like, that's the situation the controllers have found themselves in is we're in an awakened world now. We're not isolated to our little cities anymore. We have the internet where we're all connected all around the world. We know about what ha is happening everywhere. So it's really hard to control the planet now. And that's the blessing from the universe to help us be liberated. But there is this massive power grab on the negative polarity because they realize their time is running out. And so that's why it's kind of like, yo, buckle up your seatbelts, guys, because the next six years or something are going to get pretty interesting because these people are going to pull out all the stops possible as fast as possible to get that power. And so it might be a little shaky for a while, but the fact that they're that desperate is a very good sign that they know that their time is running short. And it means in particular, we need to listen to more shows like this, or actually we don't need to listen to any shows like this. We don't need to read any books. We need to hear from the inside and hear from our, our heart yeah. and take action from there and be that 5 millionth pig that goes, what? There's somebody over there saying, what? I'm not listening what? to that guy. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Eating the bugs? What? <laughs> All right. Where are we going from 3D to 4D to 5D to 6D? What do you guess is beyond that? And what do we get from door, <laughs> from the from the greatest number door as we anchor in to what's possible rather than anchoring into the old and the dark ages where we aren't going to take it anymore? Well, this is why I love the densities model so much, because when you understand the progression, it actually makes perfect sense about this is the way that consciousness evolves and why it evolves this way. There's a certain progression, like an archetypal progression. And that progression is actually the seven colors of the rainbow, the, the spectrum of color, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. That's actually like the progression of consciousness itself. We also have the seven notes on the musical scale. If you're in the key of C, C, D, E, F, G, A, B is the seventh. And when you hit C again, you're on the next octave, right? And they say that the universe is actually like that in the sense of every new universe is like a new octave that is built off the previous one. And so there are seven densities in every universe and the eighth density is the first of the next universe or octave. So Ra actually calls universes octaves in the law of one rather than universe. And I love that because everything, every, every metaphor that I use to describe things big picture is about symphony, is about tonality, is about attunement, is yeah. about frequency, is it's all about frequency. Are we in discord or accord? All of that, mm -hmm. because we are each playing our own note. Please continue. The word density is mm -hmm. confusing at first glance because you're like, what does that mean? But the density refers to the amount of light that is contained in a given space. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's the frequency of the photon. So they actually say the photon literally picks up in its frequency or vibration as the densities progress. So the photon moves faster. Yeah. And so the faster the photon is moving, the more and more ability consciousness has to express itself. So and that begins in the first density. May I pause Good you question. and ask a quick question? Yes. Is the photon carrying intelligence or information in it? I would say the photon is consciousness in, a, in physical manifestation or the way consciousness shows up yeah. in the physical. Perfect. Thank you. Please continue. So they're one. Yeah. So the first density is when consciousness begins in the universe. And so that's the five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and space. Consciousness spends a few billion years, at least we know just in the first density where consciousness, like try to imagine this consciousness goes from being the one infinite creator, filling all time and all space, possessing all knowledge in all infinity, all at once. And then it tries to go into a complete opposite position of finitude and localization in the universe. That's a huge contrast. So it can't just flip the switch and become a person on a planet. Yeah. It has to start from scratch, from the bottom up. Everything's connected and builds upon the previous thing. So it begins just as the five elements. And we know that stars form, the gas and dust coalesces, 
planets form around the stars, harden, oceans form, billions and billions of years of these five elements interacting with each other. And then eventually, once an ocean is formed, we know that uh, life begins to form, like microbial life in the oceans. And that's the beginning of the second density of consciousness. This is where consciousness now has gained the ability to become an independent kind of character in an environment. And that's maybe just like a tadpole or whatever, very, very basic organism. But nevertheless, it evolves from there. And so on our planet in particular, the second density phase was at least a few billion years before um, you know, humanoid species started to evolve into the third density. And so the, the, the whole second density spectrum is like everything from microbial life, insects, plants, animals, fish, all of that is second density. And then consciousness reaches the third density when it's able to do something that's pretty amazing when you think about it. And that is that consciousness at some point kind of flips in on itself and becomes an object to itself. Self-aware. So self-awareness is the third density. The second density is awareness. So like I'm aware there is an environment I have needs to be met, but there's really no personal I who's meeting those needs. It's just instincts functioning through a body. You know what I mean? In the third density, there's a, a character that ex appears in consciousness. I am Aaron. I'm a human being. I'm a male. I'm this many inches tall. I was born in this place. This is my birthday. And a story is built around that character, past, future, and so forth. That's the third density spectrum. So you see that consciousness has to wait until the third density before it even has the ability to choose between light and dark. Animals can't choose between light and dark. They have no concept of that yet. It's just what is to the, everything's equal to the animal. Okay. No, I'm, ta I'm taking this in all in, although if you saw my, uh, my eyes kind of go off. So I had this most amazing uh, rooster for three and a half years and rooster. Uh, rooster. And okay. if you if we had done the interview last year, he would have been in my arms at least for part of the interview. Um, and and he had um, cool as being, but you could see the internal structure because he was this latest evolution of being, but he was put in rooster form. And he's like, "How do I choose a different path while I'm in a rooster body?" And, and that's almost the, the the struggle of humanity going on right now on a level is how do I choose something differently with the wiring that I've been given? Yeah, I mean, I even have a suspicion that like dolphins might be early third density, mm -hmm. uh, elephants, like very intelligent social species, because really the, the main qualification of third density is the social hierarchy. It's where you become this hyper social species. And I mean, just think about the difference in the human social landscape versus any animal species social landscape. It's not even comparable. It's, there's so much more complexity in human socialization than even dolphins. But nevertheless, there is clearly a deep social hierarchy in a pod of dolphins, and they may even have direct telepathic language. I think they probably do. And it's really like language, I think, that allows the mind, that allows consciousness rather to evolve into the third density. Because I, I'll use the analogy of like ancient hominids, whoever our evolutionary ancestors were. At some point, hundreds of thousands of years ago, they began using grunting noises, right? To refer to objects, yeah. banana, rock, water, safe, danger. And at some point they would have used noises to refer to one another. They would have given each other noises, right? Uh, your noise is Michael. My noise is Aaron. Although their noises would have been very primitive sounding, right? But like when you're given a noise, mm -hmm. that means you, you've now, you now have a mental label that means I. So when anyone in the group says your noise, they all know it means you. And so you have to be self-reflective of me. That's my noise. Who am I? What am I? And so it allows consciousness to vibrate faster and reach third density. So we've been in third density. And by the way, these correlate to the chakras, right? I think we said that. Uh, first density is the root chakra, red ray density. Second density is the sacral chakra, orange ray density. Third density is solar plexus or yellow ray density. And we're emerging now into the fourth 
density. And that's the heart chakra or green ray density. And that's where consciousness now has picked up in vibration fast enough to where it is able to perceive, you know, it is true that we're all in separate bodies, but it seems to be even more true that we're all of the same substance or energy or origin. And so really we should not be separate from each other. We should not fight each other. We should be one. We should love each other and work together. And that's a much better way of being. That's a fourth density understanding, not a third density understanding. Third density is deeply rooted in fear of one another. And so isn't that what we see on our planet right now? where humanity is really struggling to leave that third density consciousness and realize, hey guys, whether we like it or not, we're all on the same floating ball of rock in an infinite void of infinite cosmos in all directions. We're all alone here together. So how insane is it to think about blowing each other up and nuking each other when we're all we've got? We've got to come together at all costs. Whatever the cost is, we've got to join together. And so that's what we're doing right now. This is the first interview in all interviews of ever, of ever, that she has not made wanted to make one appearance, but two. And she knows wow. totally what's going on. And so she wants to be on camera. So she, she <laughs> see, see what I'm talking Hi. about? <laughs> what's her name? It is Hannah. She goes by Hannah Bear. Hannah, she, she's a happy girl. She loves your energy. She can feel you your energy. You want to share something with me? She went like this. What do you want to share? Yeah. Just that beautiful oh. smile. Okay. Yeah. Is that so? Uh. You want to wear those right now? Yeah. <laughs> I won't be able to hear Aaron, man. but if you want to put them on for a minute, do you want to hear Aaron? Hello. Hi. <laughs> She's like, whoa, that's loud. Yeah, that is. So we're talking about our evolution of consciousness, something you're well aware of because it's your generation that is helping birth this or bring this forward. No, you She's like, oh yeah, it. I graduated third density 15 <laughs> lifetimes ago. Yeah, I get it. Oh, you want like, I'm just here to help you guys time? out now. <laughs> yeah, is that so? Do you want us to hang, out, hang in there for the interview? Yeah? What do you think? She's replacing you, you man. Good? She appears and you disappear. Yep. This... <laughs> <laughs> you're you're uh, phasing in and out of reality. Siri button here. Hold on here. Uh, oop, hold on. How do I shut off? What did you do? You managed to hit buttons without even hitting buttons. That was impressive. Psychic. Powerful so psychic. Is there anything you want to share, Hannah Bear, before we go back? Aaron's bringing us right now into the fourth ray, bringing us into the heart, which is, I think, why you came in the room right now, because you are. Yeah, you're already there. She's so cute, man. She is so hyper-focused on you right now. <laughs> yep. Is that so? All right. I'm going to go back to mommy and I'll finish. Say bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Bye. So cute, man. My heart is exploding right now. Bye-bye. Uh, See you in about 10 minutes. Sound good? Okay. We'll go ride your scooter. Scooter, how's that? I love a scooter. <laughs> what a blessing, man. Kids are so beautiful. <laughs> they have this clarity about them. Mm -hmm. And until we... Look, this world is beautiful to me. This world is incredible. This world is also walking, talking wounds and traumas that we get to lean into in order to be healed. It's also a control mechanism that's actually here to help us springboard to a higher level. But they have none of that yet. They come in with their karma. They come in with a purpose. They come in with certainly past lifetimes that, that guide and steer them. But they don't have any of that junk that's kind of been unloaded onto us, which is actually here to help serve us. But I believe they've chosen... Um, a different path, a higher path, sort of like my wife had a, an ayahuasca ceremony many years ago. And in the middle of it, she appeared as an ancestral or indigenous elder. She said to herself, how many times are you going to need to do this until you get it? Wow. Wake up. Yeah. 
And I think the kids are like, no, we don't need to play that game anymore. Yeah. You can see when you're just looking at a child like that, why Jesus said we have to become like little children again to enter the kingdom. Yeah. Because they're, they're just unconditioned. They're just present and radiant and happy and not existing outside of this moment in any way. Yeah. And it calls us back. It's why we love children, man. They just, you have to be present to be with a child. And they're our teachers. They are our greatest teachers. Big time. We're hitting fourth ray. We're getting to the heart. Yep. We're getting to the good stuff, Aaron. So the, the next ones are pretty easy to explain because number one, I haven't gone past fourth density, so I don't know what they're like, obviously, but um, but we can easily see those three densities very clear, right? There's a distinct difference in the consciousness of a rock mm -hmm. or water versus a dog mm -hmm. or a bird. But there's also a big distinction between a dog or a bird and a human being. There's like three, there are three different levels of consciousness right there. And they're, those are called the densities. It's the expression of consciousness at different densities. So in the fourth density, this is what um, extraterrestrial beings who are visiting our planet, most of them are likely fourth density because it's, it's really called the service to others density because as soon as consciousness reaches the heart, the heart just explodes into the universe with love and oneness and a desire to serve. And so fourth density beings actually evolve into the fifth by traveling through the universe being of service to other planets. And so the fifth density would correlate to the throat chakra, the blue ray. And Ra calls that the light density because light represents illumination or wisdom or knowledge. And so the fifth density is actually very different than the fourth in that fifth density beings are still traveling the universe to be of service, but in a very unique way. The fifth density being, Ra says, spends a lot more time in isolation, working on raising its frequency because the fifth density being in its higher wisdom understands that my frequency itself is the greatest service to the universe or to a planet. And so just by literally just by holding space around a planet, fifth density beings are giving that planet a high frequency of charge to, to benefit from. Does that make sense? It does. But I mean, they're living in pure light bodies at that point, whereas fourth density ETs are still in a physical chemical vehicle like ours. Yeah. probably looking more like avatar or the grays or the classic things we've seen. Uh, and then sixth density is the third eye density, the indigo ray density. And Ra says that the, the spectrum of light in fifth density is very white. Yeah. Whereas in sixth density, it becomes like a golden light. Beautiful. So that's kind of one hallmark way to know the difference. I, when I, I asked my friend about his ET encounter, I was like, what color was the light? Of course. From the being. And he was like, it was a brilliant, blinding white light. And I was like, well, that was most likely a fifth density being then mm -hmm. who you encountered. Um, and that's the, they call that the law of one density where both polarities have been harmonized. Um, the soul has to reach a perfect balance between love and wisdom to graduate to sixth density which is not as easy as it sounds. It's uh, apparently very difficult to reach that perfect balance because love just wants to serve. That's all it wants. But love can be gullible in that way. Love can be taken advantage of. Love can be foolish in the way it wants to serve. And so wisdom is kind of that masculine polarity that says, yeah, but what's really the best way to be of service? Maybe the karmic energy that being is experiencing is already their best teacher. And I don't need to do anything for them other than send them love. You know what I mean? That may be a better way to serve. So you've got to find that balance to get to sixth density. And then of course, seventh density correlates to the crown chakra. And they call that the gateway density. And they have a lot of things to say about fifth and sixth density beings. But when they're asked about what seventh density beings are like, they say we are without words because we are not in the seventh density yet. And so we don't know what that experience is like, but they do say that they have seventh density masters who teach them from the seventh density to help them evolve. So they have some interaction with seventh density beings, but they don't know what that plane of consciousness is even like. It's basically like one foot in the creator, one foot still in the universe being of service. We see oftentimes, and, and we saw it before Hannah was born, we saw it actually before uh, her sister transitioned. Hello. 
we see purple orbs, violet orbs. Mm -hmm. And I've seen one too, actually. That's that higher dimensional. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea if that's the spectrum of light that those beings would vibrate at. I don't even know if they have light bodies in the same way, maybe. Yeah. I've had theories that perhaps seventh density beings are planets and stars and things like that. Yeah. Um, but I don't think the law of one alludes to that, so I'm probably wrong on that. But I'm just trying to imagine what that could even be. It's a brilliant question. So yeah. we get to wrap things up. I want to send everybody your way. This has been phenomenal. There's, there's two last questions, three last questions that I have. First off, is it possible that as we're channeling, if we're not very specific, for instance, I teach uh, automatic writing and teach a process to put you in a bubble of love and life. Is it possible for us to pick up negative fourth density ETs or beings when we're doing channeling, if we're not careful about that? If you are channeling before you yourself have graduated to fourth density consciousness, meaning your heart chakra is not in full activation yet, then yes, absolutely. But once you're actually a fourth density being, meaning you've raised your consciousness from the solar plexus to the heart, you're living from heart-based consciousness, negative beings will come nowhere near you. Because as I mentioned earlier, it's really hard to gain negative charge. You literally have to enslave people, right? And so the negative beings are especially greedy with their polarity. They will never yeah. risk getting depolarized because it's really hard to get it back. And so being around a positively charged being who's radiating the love of the creator at the negative being is extremely depolarizing to them because the love of the creator is the most incredibly pleasurable energy in the universe. It's irresistible and it begins to depolarize the negative being. So they take off, right? So they'll never risk interacting with you if they see your green rays in full activation. But if you're still in the yellow ray, they're like, ah, we have a neophyte here. And we can take advantage. So you definitely got to be on your guard and have your protections in place. Thank you. Thank you. Where can people go to find out more, Aaron, to find your work, to find your podcast, to find everything you have to offer? So you'll find most of my work at youtube.com slash Aaron Abke. I have yeah. a huge YouTube channel with, uh, I actually organize it in series on my playlist tab. So if you go to my playlist tab, you'll see all the different series that I've done. And if you want to know more about the law of one and its incredible teachings, click on that law of one playlist and sail away into the epic journey that is the law of one. So YouTube is the first one I would recommend. I'm on Instagram at Aaron Abke. You can go to www.aaronabke.com. And if you want to join or you can join my free platform or you can join my student ascension program at 4duniversity.com. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And any last words you want to share with us, my brother? Yeah, you know, I guess oh. to encapsulate or bow tie yes. this conversation, every human being has a unique life path and journey. We're all unique expressions of the one infinite creator, but we also all have the same path in this life, which is to make that transition from the third to the fourth chakra, from the solar plexus to the heart or from ego to heart. And all of us who are in a human incarnation have to make that journey because to be born into a third density body like we are means you only have the first three chakras in activation when you're born. You don't have the green ray in automatic activation in a third density body. You have to earn it, right? In the same way that an animal like your dog doesn't have the yellow ray chakra in activation. They have the red and the orange in activation. And, you know, pets learn names and stuff. And if you call your pet by a name, it starts to gain a little bit of self-awareness there. And so their, their yellow ray chakra is firing pretty often, but it's not always active, right? And that's the same for us is that a lot of people's heart chakras fire on and off, especially if you have kids, yeah. but their default state is that ego consciousness. They keep going back out of the heart into the solar plexus. And our, our quest here is to get up into the heart and stay there and make it your home and become a being of heart-based consciousness. And you do that through love, forgiveness, service to others, seeing everyone as, as the creator, seeing everyone as one with you. And that's Ra's big message in the law of one is over and over again, they say, we're here to deliver this one truth, which is that the universe is one being. 
And if you want to experience the heavenly bliss, the joy, the ecstasy that is the universe you're living in, you have to see it as one with you. You cannot see it as separate from you and experience it at the same time. If you see the universe as separate from you, you're in a dream world of your own mind's creation, and you have to escape that dream. And the escaping of the dream, as uh, A Course in Miracles would say, is forgiveness, forgiving all the judgments, forgiving all the evil you see until you come to peace with the world you live in, and you have love for it, and you want to be of service to it. And that's the sign that you've now begun to move into that heart and activated the green ray, which uh, Ra says the fourth density is a hundred times more harmonious than the third density is. This is where we want to be. This is where everybody wants to be, whether they know it or not, is living from the heart. And you know what? It's not as difficult as you would think. It's absolutely available to everybody who's willing to do the work to get there. Awesome. 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 Let us do it. How does it get any better than this? So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, dive into the heart, do the work, get to 4D, play, 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 and send love, 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 and above and beyond all else, shine bright. Woo! Beautiful. <laughs> wow. What a special interview. What a beautiful energy. What an amazing guy. This was this was another one of those interviews that I really wanted to have where we look at the construct of things. We understand, okay, there's an interplay of darkness and light, but we can choose the light. We can go to that higher realm. We can go to 4D consciousness and beyond. We can go to that green ray and green light. And on that note, if you want to do that and traverse travel, <laughs> traverse travel along this path with me and with some other amazing mystics, come join the School of Mystics. Click on that link down below where we help you go to Greenway. We help you go to the fourth dimension. We help you ascend and go up this ladder as well. Simply click on that link below. And if you want to channel and communicate safely with the other side, with the higher dimensional beings, with your higher self, your angels, your guides, click on the next link below. That's automaticwriting.com where I will teach you live how to do just that. And if you simply want a higher dimensional attunement on a daily basis, Simply go to Daily Woohoo. That's Daily W O O H O O dot com. Here's a link to the next amazing video. Love you guys so, so much. How does it get any better than this? And keep on shining bright. Woohoo!